chapter. What data persistence means. How to store data in file A. How to store data in a database. How databases search, sort, and access data. Other options for data storage. WROX.com downloads for this chapter. For this chapter, in many scenarios you need to store data. This capability to store data in such a way that it is available for use on subsequent invocations of your program is known as data persistence because the data persists beyond the lifetime of the process that created it. To implement data persistence you need to store the data somewhere, either in a file or in a database. This chapter is a bit like a history of computing storage technologies. That's because the need to store data has grown and continues to grow ever more complex with the passage of time. You now have a broad range of technologies available covering every storage need, from 3. 104 Chapter 3 Managing Data A few simple configuration settings to sophisticated distributed data sources representing thousands of logical entities. In this chapter learn about the different options available for storing data and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Along the way, you see how Python modules assist in this fundamental programming task. Storing data using Python The simplest storage is a plain text file e. You have already seen in Chapter 2 HOW to use a text file e to store data in various formats, such as CSV and XML, as well as how to store unformatted text. These formats are fi any if you need to store the data only when the program closes and read it back when the program is started again. This situation makes these formats very suitable for configuration data or application status information. These FL at file e formats are less useful when you need to handle large volumes of data non-sequentially or search for specify C records or files. For that, you need a database. A database is just a data storage system that enables you to create, read, update, and delete individual records. This set of four fundamental data management functions is often referred to as a CRUD interface. Database records consist of one or more key files that uniquely identify the record, plus any other files needed to represent the attributes of the entity that the record represents. A Python dictionary can be used as a type of non-persistent database in that you can use the dictionary key to create, read, update, or delete a value associated with a given dictionary key, that could be a tuple of files, or a record. All that's missing is the ability to store the data between sessions. The concept of a dictionary as a database has been exploited over the years, and various forms of persistent dictionaries exist. The oldest are the database management, DBM, family of files. Using DBM as a persistent dictionary. DBM file A originated in Unix but have been developed over the years for other platforms as well. Python supports several variations. These variations are hidden by the DBM module that automatically determines the best solution based on which libraries are supported by the OS installation at hand. If no native DBM library can be found, a basic, pure Python version is used. The DBM system is a simplified version of a dictionary in that both the keys and values must be strings, which means that some data conversion and string formatting is necessary if you are using non-string data. The advantages of a DBM database are that it is simple to use, fast, and fairly compact. You can see how DBM works by revisiting the tool hire example from Chapter 2. When you last looked at it you were working from a spreadsheet as the master data source. Suppose you decided to migrate the solution to a pure Python application? you would need a storage mechanism for the various data elements. Recall that the spreadsheet had two sheets, one representing the tools for hire and the other the actual loans by the members. The record formats are shown in table 3 to 1. Storing data using Python 105. That design is phi any for a human working with a spreadsheet, but if you want to convert it into a full-blown data application you need to overcome a number of issues with it. First, there is a lot of duplication between the two entities. The name, description, and owner files are all duplicated, and therefore need to be changed in two places whenever they are edited. Both entities use the item ID as a key, which suggests the item ID represents both a tool and a loan which is confusing. Several files store names of subscribers to the service, but it would be better to have a separate entity to describe those members and reference that member entity from the other entities. Finally, although this started out as a tool hire application, there is no reason to limit it to tools. The members could just as well borrow books or DVDs or anything else. So rather than restrict it to tools, you can rename the tool entity as item. And in keeping with that, you can rename the application to REFLECT its more generic approach. Call it LendyDB. Table 3 to 1, Tool Hire Data Entities. Tool Loan Item ID Item ID Name Name Description Description Owner Owner Price Borrower Condition Date Borrowed Date Registered Date Returned. Note the changes to the tool hire data involving removal of duplication and splitting of data into single entities are typical of those performed during a data design process known as normalization. 
This is a highly formalized discipline, and whole books have been written on the subject. This book only touches on the principles, but it is an important component of good database design. If you need to design a high-performance, high-volume database, you should research normalization to become familiar with the technique. With very little effort, you can rearrange things to overcome the issues with the spreadsheet. Table 3-2 shows the resulting database design. You now have three entities, so you need to store the data in three data file A. You can use the DBM format for this because each entity now has a unique identify ER filed, which, in string format, works. 106 Chapter 3 Managing Data Try it out creating a LendyDB DBM database, create LendyDB.py. In this try it out you translate the data from the tool hire spreadsheet into the LendyDB data format and save it as three sets of DBM file A. You then prove that it worked by reading the file S and printing their contents. To do so, follow these steps. 1. Create a project folder and name it LendyDB. 2. Start your favorite editor or IDE and type the following code, or load the file e create LendyDB.py from the book's website. Import DBM. Hashtag ID, name, description, owner ID, price, condition, date registered items equals 1, lawnmower, tool, 1, dollar 150, excellent, 20120105, 2, lawnmower, tool, 2, dollar 370, fair, 20120401, 3, bike, vehicle, 3, dollar 200, good, 20130322, 4, shrill, table 3 to 2, lendy db data design, item member loan. Item ID member ID loan ID. Name name item ID. Description email borrower ID. Owner ID date borrowed. Price date returned. Condition. Date registered. Well as a DBM key. You need to populate these files with data, and that means reformatting the data from the spreadsheet. You could write a Python program to do that but, because the sample data set is small, it's easier to just cut and paste the data into the new format. Or you can extract the file S from the LendyDB folder of the chapter 3.zip file E from the download site. Once you have the data you can save it into DBM file A quite easily, as shown in the following try it out. Storing data using Python 107. Hashtag ID, item ID, borrower ID, date borrowed, date returned loans equals 1, 1, 3, 4 slash 1 slash 2012, 4 slash 26 slash 2012, 2, 2, 5, 9 slash 5 slash 2012. 1 slash 5 slash 2013, 3, 3, 4, 7 slash 3 slash 2013, 7 slash 22 slash 2013, 4, 4, 1, 11 slash 19 slash 2013, 11 slash 29 slash 2013, 5, 5, 2, 12 slash 5 slash 2013, none. Def create db, data, db name try, db equals dbm dot open, db name, c. For datum in data, db datum 0 equals, dot join, datum, finally, db dot close, print, db name, created. Def read db, db name try, db equals dbm dot open, db name, r. Print, reading, db name, return db datum for datum and db finally, db dot close. Def main, print, creating data files, create db, item. If underscore underscore name underscore underscore 3 save the file as creating data. You started off by importing the DBM module. The module internally analyzes your system to determine which DBM library is available and initializes it for use. You then created the raw data items by extracting the values from the Excel spreadsheet data. Note that you changed the item description filed so that it now records what kind of item you have, tool, book, DVD, and so on. You could have created an extra filed instead and that would have been equally valid, but for this exercise you chose to reuse the existing filed name. You then define add the create db function, which opens the dbm database file e in c, for create mode. The c mode creates a new file e if one does not exist or opens the existing file e if it has already been created. You then used a for loop to read each data item and store it in the database using the first filed as the key and joining all the files as a comma separated string for the value. You used a try slash finally construct to ensure all data was written to the file and it was closed properly. The readDB function is the converse operation to create DB. It opens the file E using R for read mode and then returns the contents as a list using a list comprehension. If you expected the database to be very large you could have made this function into a generator instead and yielded each line in turn. Because you don't expect the lending library to contain vast numbers of items or members, returning a list is phi and E. 
Finally, the main function calls the create DB function once for each data entity. Note that you do not provide any file extension, DBM does that itself. Main then checks that the data has been created correctly by printing the output from read DB for each database. The databases created by DBM consist of three file A. One file E contains the actual data, the other two file A hold the index information that DBM uses to find the records in the data file E. It is this indexing mechanism that makes DBM so much faster than simply searching sequentially through a plain text file E. You should not try to edit the DBM file A directly because this could corrupt the database. Note the mode strings used for DBM file E operations are slightly different from the normal file E modes. The default R mode is for read-only access to an existing database. W is for read-slash-write access to an existing database. C creates a new database or opens an existing one. N always creates a new, empty database. Having created your database, you can now use it to read or edit the contents. This is best demonstrated from an interactive session at the Python prompt, so fire up the Python interpreter from the folder where you saved the data files and type the following. Import dbm items equals dbm.open, item, members equals dbm.open, membered, loans equals dbm.open, loaned, w. Storing data using Python 109. LOAN2 equals loans 2.decode, LOAN2, 2, 2, 2, 5, 9, slash 5, slash 2012, 1, slash 5, slash 2013, LOAN2 equals loan 2.split, LOAN2, 2, 2, 5, 9, slash 5, slash 2012, 1 slash 5 slash 2013, ITEM2 equals items loan 2 1 dot decode, dot split, ITEM2 2, 2 lawnmower, tool, 2, dollar 370, fair, 2012 04 01, member 2 equals members loan 2 2 dot decode, dot split, member 2 5, an, annie at bigbiz.com, print, borrowed aon, dot format, member 2 1 item 2 1 loan 2 3, and borrowed a lawnmower on September 5th, 2012. With the preceding commands, you opened the three databases, extracted loan number two, using decode, to convert from the DBM bytes format into a normal Python string, and split it into its separate files. You then extracted the corresponding member and item records by using the loan record values as keys. Finally, you printed a message reporting the data in human readable form. Of course, you can create new records in the data set, too. Here is how you create a new loan record. Max, loans.keys, decode, 5 key equals int max, loans.keys, decode, plus 1 nulo and equals str, key, 2, 1, 4 slash 5 slash 2014, loans str, key, equals, dot join, nulo and, loans str, key, b, 6 comma 2 comma 1 comma 4 slash 5 slash 2014. With the preceding code, you used the built-in max, function to find the highest existing key value in the loans database. You then created a new key by converting that maximum value to an integer and adding 1. Next, you used the string version of the new key value to create a new loan record. You then wrote that record out to the database using the new key filed. Finally, you checked that the new record existed by using the new key value to read the record back. You can see that DBM files can be used as a database, even with multiple entities. However, if the data is not naturally string-based, or has many files, extracting the files and converting to the appropriate format becomes tedious. You can write helper functions or methods to do that conversion for you but there is an easier way. Python has a module that can store arbitrary Python objects to files and read them back without you having to do any data conversion. It's time to meet the pickle module. Using pickle to store and retrieve objects. The pickle module is designed to convert Python objects into sequences of binary bytes. The object types converted include the basic data types, such as integers and boolean values, as well as system and user-defined ed classes and even collections such as lists, tuples, and functions, except those defined ed using lambda. A few restrictions exist on objects that can be pickled, these are described in the module documentation. 110 Chapter 3 Managing Data Pickle is not of itself a data management solution, it merely converts objects into binary sequences. These sequences can be stored in binary file A and read back again so they can be used as a form of data persistence. But Pickle does not provide any means to search the stored objects or retrieve a single object from among many stored items. You must read the entire stored inventory back into memory and access the objects that way. Pickle is ideal when you just want to save the state of a program so that you can start it up and continue from the same position as before, for example, if you were playing a game. Note converting data to strings, or bytes, for storage or transmission over a network is a common operation in computing, as such, the process has a generic name, serialization, sometimes known as marshalling. 
Pickle is a Python specify C form of serialization. The JavaScript object notation, JSON, data format is another form of serialization that is widely used across languages, especially on the web. You find out more about JSON in Chapter 5. Pickle is more powerful than JSON but less general because it is restricted to Python applications. The Pickle module provides several functions and classes, but you normally only use the dump and load functions. The dump function dumps an object or objects to a file and the load function reads an object from a file, usually an object previously written with dump. To see how this works, you can use the interactive prompt and experiment with the item data definition from LendyDB in the previous section. You start off by creating a single item and this time, instead of using a single string for all the values, you use a tuple, like this. Import pickle an item equals 1, lawn mower, tool, 1, dollar 150, excellent, 20120105 with open, item.pickle, wb, as pf. Pickle.dump, an item pf. With open, item.pickle, rb, as pf. Item copy equals pickle.load, pf. Print, item copy, 1, lawn mower, tool, 1, dollar 150, excellent, 2012-01-05. Notice that you have to use binary file modes for the pickle file. Most importantly, notice that you got a list back from the file, not just a string. Of course, these elements are all strings, so just for fun try pickling some different data types. Fun data equals a string, true, 42, 3.14159, embedded, list, with open, data.pickle, wb, as pf. Pickle.dump, fun data, pf. With open, data.pickle, rb, as pf. Copy data equals pickle.load, pf. Storing data using Python 111. Print, copy data, a string, true, 42, 3.14159, embedded, list. That all worked as expected, and you got back the same data that you put in. The only other thing you need to know about pickle is that it is not secure. It potentially executes objects that get unpickled, so you should never use pickle to read data received from untrusted sources. But for local object persistence in a controlled environment, it does a great job very simply. If you are using pickle in your own projects you should be aware that you can get some pickle specify C exceptions raised so you might want to wrap your code inside a try slash accept construct. For your LendyDB project, the big problem with pickle is that you can only access the data by reading the whole file into memory. Wouldn't it be great if you could have an indexed file of arbitrary Python objects by combining the features of pickle and DBM? It turns out that you can, and the work has been done for you in the shelve module. Accessing objects with shelve. The shelve module combines the DBM module's ability to provide random access to file A with pickle's ability to serialize Python objects. It is not a perfect solution in that the key file must still be a string and the security issue with pickle also applies to shelve, so you must ensure your data sources are safe. Also, like DBM files the module cannot tell if you modify data read into memory, so you must explicitly write any changes back to the file by reassigning to the same key. Finally, DBM files impose some limits around the size of objects they can store and are not designed for concurrent access from, for example, multiple threads or users. However, for many projects, Shelve provides a simple, lightweight, and fairly fast solution for storing and accessing data. So as far as you are concerned, Shelve acts just like a dictionary. Almost everything you do with a dictionary you can also do with shelve instances. The only difference is that the data remains on the disk rather than being in memory. This has obvious speed implications, but on the other hand, it means you can work with very large dictionaries even when memory is limited. Before you build LendyDB with shelve, you'll experiment with some dummy data that includes a bigger selection of data types, including a user-defined ed class. The FIRST thing you do is create the shelve database file, or, as they are sometimes known, a shelf. Shelf equals shelf.open, fundata.shelf, c. The open function takes the same arguments as the DBM version discussed earlier. Because you are creating a new shelf, you use mode c for create. Now you can start adding items to the shelf. Shelf tuple equals 1, 2, a, uh, b true false, shelf lists equals 1, 2, 3, 3 true false, 3.14159, 66. With these commands, you saved two items, each of which contains a mix of Python data types, and Shelve happily stored them without any data conversion required by you. You can check that Shelve saved the items by reading the values back. Shelf tuple, 1, 2, a, uh, b, true, false, Shelf lists 1, 2, 3, true, false, 3.14159, minus 66. 
112 Chapter 3 Managing Data To make the data changes permanent you need to call close, normally you would use a try slash finally construct or, unlike DBM, you can use a context manager style. Shelf.close, shelf tuple trace back, most recent call last file, c backslash python 33 backslash lib backslash shelf.py, line 111, in underscore underscore get it um underscore underscore value equals self.cache key key error, tuple. During handling of the above exception, another exception occurred. Trace back, most recent call last file, line 1, in file, c backslash python 33 backslash lib backslash shelf.py, line 113, in underscore underscore get it um underscore underscore f equals bytes io, self dot dict key dot encode, self dot key encoding, file, c backslash python 33 backslash lib backslash shelf dot pi, line 70, in closed raise value error, invalid operation on closed shelf, value error, invalid operation on closed shelf you can see that after closing the shelf you can no longer access the data, you need to reopen the shelf. Now you can try something slightly more complex. First, you defy any a class, create some instances, and then store them to a shelf. Class test, def underscore underscore init underscore underscore, self x y, self dot x equals x, self dot y equals y, def show, self, print, self dot x, self dot y, shelf equals shelf dot open, test dot shelf, c, a equals test, one comma two, a dot show, one two b equals test, a, b, b dot show, a b shelf twelve equals a shelf of equals b. So far, so good. You have saved two instances of the class. Getting them back is just as easy. Shelf 12 shelf of C equals shelf 12 C dot show, 1 2 D equals shelf of D dot show, a B shelf dot close. Storing data using Python 113. Notice that the object return is reported as a under underscore main underscore underscore dot test object. That raises one very important caveat about saving and restoring user defined ed classes. You must make sure that the very same class definition used by shelf for the save is also available to the module that reads the class back from the shelf, and the class definitions must be the same. If the class definition changes between writing the data and reading it back, the result is unpredictable. The usual way to make the class visible is to put it into its own module. That module can then be imported, and used in the code that writes, as well as the code that reads, the shelf. Note you defy any two special methods in your class, underscore underscore get state underscore underscore and underscore underscore set state underscore underscore that tell pickle and therefore shelve exactly which attributes to save this can avoid some issues with changes to class definitions provided these two methods themselves don't change the documentation contains examples of this mechanism at work in general it's best to avoid changes to the class definitions if at all possible it's time to revisit your lending library lendy db this time you replicate what you did with the DBM database, but use the shelf module instead. Try it out using shelf to store LendyDB, shelf LendyDB.py. In this try it out, you replicate the functionality of the DBM example but use shelf instead. The code is simpler as a result. To do this, complete the following steps. 1. Change into your LendyDB project folder. 2. Open your favorite editor or IDE and type in the following code or load shelf lendydb.py from the lendydb folder of the downloaded file lay. Import shelf. Hashtag ID, name, name, description, owner ID, price, condition, date registered items equals 1, lawn mower, tool, 1, dollar 150, excellent, 20120105, 2, lawn mower, tool, 2, dollar 370, fair, 20120401, 3, bike, vehicle, 3, dollar 200, good, 20130322, 4, shrill, tool, 4, dollar 100, good, 20131028, 5, scarifier, tool, 5, dollar 200, average, 20130914, 6, sprinkler, tool, 1, dollar 80, good, 0140106. Hashtag ID, name, email members equals 1, Fred, Fred at lendalib.org, 2, Mike, Mike at gmail.com, 3, Joe, Joe at joesmail.com, 4, Rob, rjb at somcorp.com, 5, Anne, Annie at bigbiz.com. 114 Chapter 3 Managing Data Hashtag ID, Item ID, Borrower ID, Date Borrowed, Date Returned Loans equals 1, 1, 3, 4 slash 1 slash 2012, 4 slash 26 slash 2012, 2, 2, 5, 9 slash 5 slash 2012, 1 slash 5 slash 2013, 3, 3, 4, 7 slash 3 slash 2013, 7 slash 22 slash 2013, 4, 4, 1, 
11 slash 19 slash 2013, 11 slash 29 slash 2013, 5, 5, 2, 12 slash 5 slash 2013, none. Def create db, data, shelf name try, shelf equals shelf dot open, shelf name, c. For datum in data, shelf datum 0 equals datum finally, shelf dot close. Def read db, shelf name try, shelf equals shelf dot open, shelf name, r. Return shelf key for key in shelf finally, shelf dot close, def main, print, creating data files, create db, items, item shelf, create db, members, member shelf, create db, loans, loan shelf. Print, reading items, print, read db, item shelf, print, reading members, print, read db, member shelf, print, reading loans, print, read db, loan shelf. If underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals equals underscore underscore main underscore underscore main. 3. Save the file as shelf lendy db.py and run it. 4. Check that your output matches the following output. Creating data files. Reading items. 1. Lawn mower. Tool. 1. Dollar 150. Excellent. 2012-01-05. 3. Bike. Vehicle. 3. Dollar 200. Good. 2013-03-22. 2. Dollar 370. Storing data. 5. Start the Python interpreter and experiment with the data by typing the following. Import shelf items equals shelf dot open, item shelf, W, members equals shelf dot open, member shelf, W, loans equals shelf dot open, loan shelf, W, LOAN2, e, member 2, 6 add a new loan key equals int, how it works. The file is very similar to the one using DBM. You start off by importing shelf instead of DBM. The three sets of data definitions that follow are identical to the earlier example. You then define any the two functions, create DB, and read DB. This is where the shelf version starts to simplify the code. For creation, the shelf is opened and the data is written to the shelf directly instead of having to use the string join method. For reading, things are almost identical but you use a list comprehension to retrieve, store, and return the shelf content. The main function is also very similar to the DBM example except for a few tweaks to the printed. Messages. At this stage the shelf solution doesn't seem to have been a huge advantage. However, when you start to access the data and modify it, the situation begins to improve. Open the three shelves and repeat the exercises from the DBM section. But this time you do not need to split the values to get a list and you do not need to mess with decode to get from bytes to normal strings. This makes the code shorter and easier to read. If the records had contained mixed types, the savings would have been even more obvious. Finally, you create a new loan record. Again, this does not require any decoding or joining of strings. When you close the shelf, you ensure the data is written to disk. 116 Chapter 3 Managing Data You've now seen the various options Python offers for storing objects and retrieving them. The shelf module, in particular, offers a persistence mechanism that is compact, fairly fast, and simple to use. If you have a solution that uses Python dictionaries in memory, switching to a shelf solution is almost a trivial task. However, this is still a long way short of what is needed for complex data handling. Operations like phi ending a set of records based on non-key values or sorting the data essentially still require a complete read of the data into memory. The only way to avoid that is to move to a full-blown database solution. However, before you look at that you should consider some aids that Python provides to make data analysis of in-memory data sets easier. Analyzing data with Python. Once you have a set of data, you usually want to ask questions about it. For example, in the lending library example, you might want to know the total cost of the items or even the average cost of an item. You might want to know who contributed the most items, which items are out on loan at any given time, and so on. You can do that using Python, and you could write functions using all the standard Python features that would answer those questions. However, Python has some powerful features that often get overlooked that are especially useful for analyzing data sets. In this section you look at some of the built-in features you can use, especially the functional programming features of the language. Then you turn your attention to the Adair Tools module, which offers more advanced features that often save time and computing resources when compared with the standard alternatives. Analyzing data using built-in features of Python. When you analyze data, it is important to select the right data structure. For example, Python includes a set data type that automatically eliminates duplicates. If you care only about unique values, converting or extracting the data to a set can simplify the process considerably. Similarly, 
Using Python dictionaries to provide keyword access rather than numeric indices often improves code readability, and thus reliability, you saw an example of that in Chapter 2 THAT compared the CSV dictionary-based reader with the standard tuple-based reader. If you are finding that your code is getting complicated, it's often worthwhile to stop and consider whether a different data structure would help. In addition to the wide variety of data structures, Python also offers many built-in and standard library functions that you can use, such as any, all, map, sorted, and slicing. Slicing isn't technically a function but an operation, however it does return a value in a similar way that a function would. When you combine these functions with Python generator expressions and list comprehensions, you have a powerful toolkit for slicing and dicing your data. You can apply these techniques to your LendyDB data to answer the questions raised in the opening paragraph of this Analyzing Data with Python section. You can try that now. Try it out analyzing LendyDB with Python, lendydata.py. In this try it out, you use standard Python features to answer the questions about the LendyDB data raised earlier. 1. What is the total cost of all items? 2. What is the average cost of an item? Analyzing data with Python 117. 3. Who contributed the most items? 4. Which items are currently on loan? To do this, complete the following steps. 1. Create a module called lendydata.py containing the following code, or load it from the analysis folder of the downloadable file lay. Items equals ID, name, description, owner ID, price, condition, registered, 1. Lawnmower, tool, 1. $150, excellent, 2020105, 2, lawnmower, tool, 2, $370, fair, 2012401, 3, bike, vehicle, 3, $200, good, 2013032, 4, shrill, tool, 4, $100, good, 2013028, 5, scarifier, tool, 5, $200, average, 2013094, 6, sprinkler, Tool, one, dollar eighty, good, two zero one four zero one zero six. Members equals ID, name, email, one, Fred, Fred at Lendalib.org, two, Mike, Mike at gmail.com, three, Joe, Joe at Joe's mail.com, four, Rob, RJB at Somcorp.com, five, Ann, Annie at Bigbiz.com. Loans equals ID, item ID, borrower ID, date borrowed, date returned, one, one, three, four slash one slash twenty twelve. 4 slash 26 slash 2012, 2, 2, 5, 9 slash 5 slash 2012, 1 slash 5 slash 2013, 3, 3, 4, 7 slash 3 slash 2013, 7 slash 22 slash 2013, 4, 4, 1, 11 slash 19 slash 2013, 11 slash 29 slash 2013, 5, 5, 2, 12 slash 5 slash 2013, none. To start the Python interpreter and import the data using the following command. From Lendy data import asterisk. 3. To answer the question, what is the total cost of all items, type the following code. Def cost, item. Return int, item 41. Cost, items 2, 370 sum, cost, item, for item in items 1, 1100. 4. To answer the question, what is the average cost of an item, type this. Sum, cost. Item, for item in items 1, slash len, items, 1 183.3333333334. 5. To answer the question, who contributed the most items, type this. Def owner, item return item 3. 118 chapter 3 managing data. For member in members 1, count equals 0, for item in items 1, if owner, item, equals equals member 0, count plus equals 1, print, member 1, colon count. Fred, 2 Mike, 1 Joe, 1 Rob, 1 Ann, 1. 6. To answer the question, which items are currently on loan, type this. Def on loan, loan return loan 1 equals equals none. Items int, loan 1, for loan in loans if on loan, loan, 5, scarifier, tool, 5, dollar 200, average, 2013-09-14. How it works. You started by creating a Python module containing your sample data and importing that data into the interpreter. Note the handy trick of using the FIRST entry, having index 0, in each data section to store a list of that section's filed descriptions. This has two useful effects. One every ID value of any given data section, of the three sections, now matches the zero relative index of that same row in its section. For example, the micro of the members data section, having an ID of 3, can now be accessed as members 3. 
2. You have access to the filed names, both programmatically and as an aid to memoir in the interpreter, by accessing the file RST record. The downside is that, in your processing code, you must remember to adjust by one the length, and indices, of the data sections, to account for the extra header line record of each section. You then used standard Python tools to answer several questions about the data using standard Python tools. For each question you define at a small helper function that typically just extracted a filed from a data entry. For the file RST question it returned the cost as an integer value by extracting the string value and stripping the dollar sign from the front before converting to an integer. You then used Python's built-in sum, function applied to a generator expression to calculate the total cost of the items. And you computed the average item cost by dividing that total cost by the number of items. To find out who contributed which items, you define at a function owner, that simply extracted the owner ID filed from an item record. You then looped over all the members checking how many items each member owned. Finally, you determined which items were out on loan by creating a helper function, called on loan, that returned a boolean result depending on whether or not the date returned filed. Analyzing data with Python 119 was none. You then used this in a list comprehension with a filter condition using the onLoan function. In the preceding try it out you saw that you can use the built-in functions and data structures combined with loops and generators to answer most questions about data. The problem is that for volumes of data this technique requires storing large lists in memory and may involve looping over those lists many times. This can become very slow and resource intensive. The Python it Air Tools module provides several functions that can reduce the load significantly. Analyzing data with it Air Tools. The ITAIR Tools module of the standard Python library provides a set of tools that utilize functional programming principles to consume iterable objects and produce other iterables as results. This means that the functions can be combined to build sophisticated data filters. Before looking at how ITAIR Tools can be used on the LendyDB data, you should look at some of the functions provided using simpler data sets. These functions are powerful, but operate in slightly different ways than most of the functions you have dealt with in the past. In particular, they are all geared around processing iterators. You should recall that all the standard Python collections, as well as objects such as files, are iterators. You can also create your own custom iterators by defining some methods that adhere to the Python iterator protocol. The simplest iterators are strings, so that's mainly what the documentation uses to demonstrate the iter tools functions, but remember that these functions work with any kind of iterator, not just strings. Utility functions. The FIRST group of functions you look at includes relatively simple functions that you typically use to provide input to the other functions in the module. The COUNT function works a lot like the built-in RANGE function, except where RANGE generates numbers up to a limit, COUNT generates an indefinite series of numbers from a start point, incrementing by a given, optional, step size. It looks like this. Import it air tools as it for n in it dot count, 15 comma 2. If n. Else, break. 15 17 19 21 23 25 27 29 31 33 35 37 39 The repeat function is even simpler, it just repeats its argument continuously, or for the number of repetitions specify ed, like this. For n in range, 7. Print, next, it dot repeat, yes, end equals. Yes 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 list, it dot repeat, 6 comma 3, 6, 6, 6. 120 Chapter 3 Managing Data The cycle, function rotates over the input sequence over and over again. This is useful for building round-robin, style iterations for load balancing or resource allocation. Consider the case where you have a number of resources and want to allocate data to each resource in turn. You can build a list of resources, then cycle over that list until you run out of data. You can simulate this technique using lists as resources, like this. RES1 equals RES2 equals RES3 equals resources equals it dot cycle, RES1 RES2 RES3, for n in range, 30. RES equals next, resources. RES dot append, n. RES1 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27 RES2 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16, 19, 22, 25, 28 RES3 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, 20, 23, 26, 29. The chain, function concatenates all the input arguments into a single collection and then returns each element. If the arguments were all of the same type, you could achieve the same result by adding the collections together with the plus operator, but chain, also works for types of collections that are not compatible with the plus operator. 
Here is an example using a list, a string, and a set. Items equals it dot chain, 1 comma 2 comma 3, a string comma a, set, of, strings, for item in items. Print, item. 1 2 3 ASTRING A of set strings. Note several of the iter tools functions produce a potentially infinite series of output data. This has the potential to lock your program into an infinite loop. You need to take extra care to ensure you provide an exit mechanism when using these functions. Analyzing data with Python 121. Finally, there is the ILIS, function that works like the slice operator but, because it uses a generator, is more memory efficient. It does have one significant difference from the normal slice, you cannot use negative indices to count backward from the end, because iterators do not always have well-defined at endpoints. You could use ILIS, like this. Data equals list, range, 20, data 3 colon 12 colon 2 3, 5, 7, 9, 11 for d in it dot ILIS, data 3 comma 12 comma 2 print, d, end equals, 3 5 7 9 11. Iter tools can do much more than just generate data. It can also help analyze data using a variety of data processing functions. Data processing functions. ITER Tools has many data processing functions that either take input data and transform the elements, or filter the contents in some way. By combining these functions you can build sophisticated data processing tools. One feature that many of these functions have in common is that they accept a function object as a parameter. Note passing functions as arguments is a common feature of functional programming style and can seem a little strange at FIRST. You just need to remember that, in Python, a function is an object, too. A function name is just like any other variable, it is simply a reference to a function object. As such, you can pass a function name, such as f, into another function, say, g, and function g can call the input function f internally. Functions that return a boolean result are often referred to as predicates. The compress function acts a little bit like a higher order version of the bitmasks that you explored in chapters 1a and d2. It takes a collection of data as its FIRST argument and a collection of Boolean values as its second. It returns those items of the FIRST collection that correspond to the true values of the second collection. Here is a basic example. For item in it dot compress, 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 comma 5 comma false true false 0 comma 1. Print, item. 2 5. Note that the Boolean values do not need to be pure Boolean values, they can be anything that Python can convert to Boolean, even expressions. The iter tools .filter false function works in exactly the same way, but in reverse, it returns those elements whose corresponding boolean flags are false instead of true. 122 Chapter 3 Managing Data Likewise, the drop while and take while functions have related, but opposite, effects. Both take an input function in a collection or iterator as arguments and then apply the function to the input data elements one at a time. Drop while ignores all of the input elements until the function argument evaluates to false, whereas take while returns the elements until the result is false. You can see the difference in these examples that use the same input data and argument function. Def single digit, and return n for n in it dot drop while, single digit range, 20, print, and end equals. 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 for n in it dot take while, single digit range, 20, print, and end equals. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Note that both of these functions stop processing the data after the FIRST time a trigger is detected. Consider this example. For n in it dot drop while, single digit 1, 2, 12, 4, 20, 7, 999 print, and end equals. 12, 4, 27, 999. Notice that the output includes the single digit numbers following the FIRST non, single digit number, for the reason just indicated, once drop while stops dropping, nothing else is dropped thereafter. And tech while's taking behavior is analogous. The accumulate function applies its input function to each element of the input data along with the result of the previous operation. The default function is addition and the FIRST result is always the FIRST element. Thus, for an input data set of 1, 2, 3, 4 the initial value, result 1, is 1 followed by the function applied to result 1 and 2 to produce result 2, and to result 2 and 3 to create result 3, and to result 3 and 4 to create result 4. The output is result 1, result 2, result 3, and result 4. The phi nal result value is the same as applying the reduce function from the functools module. Here is an example using accumulate, s default addition operator. For n in it dot accumulate, 1, 2, 3, 4 print, n, n equals 13610. Taming the vagaries of Grookby. 
Group B is one of the most useful and powerful of the ITER tool's functions, but it has a number of little foibles that can catch you out. Its basic role is to collect the input data into groups based on a key derived by an input function and return those groups as iterators in their own right. The phi RST problem is that the function only groups for as long as it phi NDS the same key, but it creates a new group if a new key is found. Then, if the original key is found later in the sequence, it creates a new group with the same key rather than adding the new element to the original group. To avoid this behavior, it is best if the input data is sorted using the same key function used by group B. The second snag is that the groups generated by group B are not really independent iterators, they are effectively views into the original input collection. Thus, if the function moves on to the analyzing data with Python 123. Next group of data, the previous groups become invalid. The only way to retain the groups for later processing is to copy them into a separate container a list, for example. To reinforce these concepts, you look at an example that produces a set of data groups that can be processed independently. The example is built up to the phi NAL, correct solution starting from an initial, naive, but broken solution. First, you define any several groups of data and use the built-in all function as a key. The all function returns true when all of its input data items are true. Data equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 for D in data. Print all D. True, false, false, true. Next, you apply the group B function to your data. For KYGRP in it dot group B, data key equals all, print, ky, grp, true, false, true. You can see that group B returned two separate groups both keyed on true. To avoid that you must sort the data before processing it with group B, like this. For kygrp in it dot group B, sorted, data key equals all, key equals all, print, ky, grp, false, true. Now you want to try to access these groups, so you store each one in a variable. For kygrp in it dot group B, sorted, Data key equals all, key equals all, if ky, true a set equals grp, else, false set equals grp, for item in false set, print, item. As you can see, false set is empty. That's because the false set group was created phi rst and then the underlying iterator, grp, moved on, thus invalidating the value just stored in false set. To save the sets for later access, you need to store them as lists, like this. Groups equals true, false for ky grp in it dot group b. Sorted, data key equals all, key equals all, groups ky dot append, list, grp. 124 Chapter 3 Managing Data Groups false, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, true, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 Notice that you created a dictionary whose keys are the expected ones, true and false, and whose values are lists. You then had to append the groups, converted to lists, as you found them. This may seem complex, but if you remember to sort the input data phi RST and copy the groups into lists as group B generates them, you will find that group B is a powerful and useful tool. Using ITER tools to analyze LendyDB data. You've seen what ITER tools has to offer, so now it's time to try using it with your LendyDB data. You want to repeat the analysis that you did using the standard tools, but see how the ITER tools functions can be brought to bear, too. Remember, the real point of the ITER tools module is not so much that it gives you new features, but rather that it lets you process large volumes of data more efficiently. Given the tiny amount of data you are using in this chapter, you won't actually see any efficiency improvements, but as you scale the data volumes up, it does make a difference. Try it out analyzing the LendyDB data using ITER tools. In this try it out, you repeat the earlier analysis of the LendyDB data using some of the ITER tools functions. To achieve this, follow these steps, one change into the folder where you stored the lendydata.py file. Two start the Python interpreter and import the data file using the following command. From lendydata import asterisk 3. Import the ITER tools module. From ITER tools import asterisk 4. To answer the question, what is the total cost of all items, type this. Def cost, item, return int, item 4 1, for n in idleis, accumulate, cost, item, for item in items 1, len, items, 2 none, Print, n. 1105. To answer the question, what is the average cost of an item, type this. n slash len, items, 1183.3333333333346. To answer the question, who contributed the most items, type this. Def owner, item return item 3. 
Managing data using SQL 125. Owners equals for KYGRP in group B, sorted, items 1, key equals owner, key equals owner, owners KY equals len, list, GRP, for member in members 1, print, member 1, owners member 0. Fred, 2 Mike, 1 Joe, 1 Rob, 1 Ann, 1. 7 To answer the question, which items are currently on loan, type this. Def returned, loan return not, loan 1 equals equals none. Items int, loan 1, for loan in filter false, returned loans, 5, scarifier, tool, 5, dollar 200, average, 2013-09-14. How it works. As in the previous try it out you created small helper functions to improve the readability of the code. To answer the FIRST question you used the accumulate function to produce a running count of the costs, then used ILIS to extract only the last item by specifying a start index of len, items, two and a stop index of none. You had to subtract two to account for the headers line at the start of items. Because the result, n, was still in scope, you could calculate the average by simply dividing n by the number of items. The question of who contributed most is answered quite differently from the previous try it out because you used group b, to gather the related items. In this case you are interested only in the size of the group, not the details, so you used len, to calculate the size of the group. You then iterated over the members, in conventional style, to print the names and counts. You answered the phi NAL question by inverting the logic of the helper function, returned, to return whether an item has been returned. By using that in the filter false, function, you could phi ND those items that had not been returned and, therefore, were still out on loan. In this section you have seen how a mix of the conventional Python data structures, functions, and operators, combined with the functional techniques of the ITER tools module, enable you to perform complex analysis of quite large data sets. However, there comes a point when the volume and complexity of the data call for another approach, and that means introducing a new technology, relational databases powered by the structured query language, SQL. Managing data using SQL. In this section you are introduced to some of the concepts behind SQL and relational databases. You find out how to use SQL to create data tables and populate them with data, and how to manipulate the data contained within those tables. You go on to link tables to capture the relationships between data and finally apply all of these techniques to your lending library data. 126 Chapter 3 Managing Data Relational Database Concepts The basic principle of a relational database is very simple. It's simply a set of two-dimensional tables. Columns are known as files and rows as records. Field values can refer to other records, either in the same table, or in another table that's the relational part. A table holding data about employees might look like table 3 to 3. Table 3 to 3, employee data. Empid name hire date grade manager at 1020304 John Brown 2003062342 form in 1020311. 1020305 Fred Smith 20040302 Laborer 1020304102037 Ann Jones 1999911125 Laborer 1020304 Relationship Cardinality Relationships within a database link two or more entities together. The number of each entity involved in the relationship is known as its cardinality. The relationships can be one to one, where one record links to exactly one other record. They can also be one-to-many, such as the employee-to-manager relationship in the example. A relationship can also be many-to-many. -many. This relationship is best explained by an example. Suppose you introduced a new table of tasks. Each task could have many employees assigned to it. At the same time, each employee could have several tasks. There is, therefore, a many-to-many -many relationship between employees and tasks. Much of the work in any database application is focused on maintaining the many-to-many -many relationships within the database. Several forms of graphical notation, known as entity relationship diagrams, are used to describe database structures. Most of these notations have a strong emphasis on showing the cardinality of each relationship. Notice a couple of conventions demonstrated by this data. You have an identify ER, ID, filed to uniquely identify each row, this ID is known as the primary key. It is possible to have other keys too, but conventionally, there is nearly always an ID filed to uniquely identify a record. This helps should an employee decide to change her name, for example. You can link one row to another by having a file that holds the primary key value for another row. Thus an employee's manager is identified by the manager ID filed, which is simply a reference to another EMP ID entry in the same table. Looking at your data, you see that both Fred and Ann are managed by John who is, in turn, managed by someone else, 
whose details are not visible in this section of the table. Managing data using SQL 127. To determine employee John Brown's salary, you would fire RST look up John's grade in the main employee data table. You would then consult the salary table to learn what an employee of that grade is paid. Thus you can see that John, a foreman, is paid $60,000. Relational databases take their name from this ability to link table rows together in relationships. Other database types include network databases, hierarchical databases, and FL at file databases, which includes the DBM databases you looked at earlier in the chapter. For large volumes of data, relational databases are by far the most common. You can do much more sophisticated queries, too, and you look at how to do this in the next few sections. But before you can query anything, you need to create a database and insert some data. Structured Query Language The Structured Query Language, or SQL, pronounced either as SQL or as the letters SQL, is the standard software tool for manipulating relational databases. In SQL an expression is often referred to as a query, regardless of whether it actually returns any data. SQL is comprised of two parts. The FIRST is the Data Definition Language, DDL. This is the set of commands used to create and alter the shape of the database itself its structure. DDL tends to be quite specify C to each database, with each vendor's DLL having a slightly different syntax. The other part of SQL is the Data Manipulation Language, DML. DML, used to manipulate database content rather than structure, is much more highly standardized between databases. You spend the majority of your time using DML rather than DDL. Table 3 to 4, Salary Data. Grade Amount 000010 Foreman 60,000. 000011 Laborer 35,000. Note in this book you use the SQLite database system, which has three big advantages. First, it has an API module provided as part of Python's standard library. Second, it is a simple dialect of SQL to learn. Third, and by no means least, SQLite works from a single data file e encode library so you don't need to set up a database server or worry about any of the database administration duties normally associated with maintaining relational databases. You only look refill y at DDL, just enough to create, with the create command, and destroy, with the drop command, your database tables so that you can move on to filling them with data, retrieving that data in interesting ways, and even modifying it, using the DML commands, insert, select, update, and delete. You are not restricted to linking data within a single table. You can create another table for salary. A salary can be related to grade, and so you get a second table like table 3 to 4. 128 Chapter 3 Managing Data Creating Tables To create a table in SQL you use the create command. It is quite easy to use and takes the following form. Create table table name, field name, field name. Note to use the SQL interactive prompt you need to download the SQLite interpreter because it does not come with Python. You can find it on the SQLite website at http slash 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 download dot html http slash 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 download dot html. The versions may not match exactly, but the database format is sufficiently stable that the latest interpreter can generally be used with the Python Sklite 3 module without difficulty, although the versions might not match exactly. You only need to download the binary for your OS labeled shell, the libraries are already installed with Python. Linux users can usually find SQLite in the package manager, and this is the easiest way to install it, if available. You can find the OFFI shell guide to the SQLite interpreter at http colon slash slash SQLite http colon slash slash SQLite.org slash CLI.html.org slash CLI.html. Note SQL statements in the interpreter must be terminated with a semicolon. This is because SQL statements can span multiple lines, so the interpreter needs to be told when you are done. SQL executed by Python code is passed as a single, complete string, so a closing semicolon is not necessary. SQL is not case sensitive and, unlike Python, does not care about wit space or indentation levels. An informal style convention is used, but it is not rigidly adhered to, and SQL itself cares not a jot. Try creating your employee and salary tables in SQLite. The FIRST thing to do is start the interpreter, which you do simply by invoking SQLite 3 with a single command line argument, the database file a name. If that database file exists, the interpreter will open it. Otherwise it will create a new database file by that name. If you omit the database file a name entirely, the interpreter will still process your commands, but your data will exist only in RAM, and will disappear irretrievably when you exit the interpreter. Thus, to create an employee database you execute the SQLite interpreter like this. 
Dollar Sky 3 Employee. DBS Q Lite version 3.8.2 December 6, 2013. 14 hours 53 minutes and 30 seconds. Enter. Help for instructions. Enter SQL statements terminated with a Sky. The interpreter creates an empty database called employee.db and leaves you at the Sklite prompt, ready to type SQL commands. You are now ready to create some tables. Sklite create table employee. EMP ID name hire date grade manager ID. Managing data using SQL 129. Sklite create table salary, salary ID, grade amount, Sklite.tables employee salary Sklite. Note that you moved the list of files into a separate line, making it easier to see them. The files are listed by name but have no other defining information such as data type. This is a peculiarity of SQLite. Most databases require you to specify the type along with the name. It is possible to specify types in SQLite too, but it is not essential. You look at this in more detail later in the chapter. Also note that you tested that the create statements had worked by using the dot tables command to list all the tables in the database. The SQLite interpreter supports several of these dot commands that you use to find out about your database. Help provides a list of the commands along with a brief description of their functions. You can do lots of other things when you create a table. As well as declaring the types of data in each column, you can also specify constraints on the values. Constraints are rules that the database enforces to help ensure the data remains consistent. For example, not null means the value is mandatory and must be filled in, and unique means that no other record can have the same value in that filed. Usually you specify the primary key filed to be not null and unique. You can also specify which file is the primary key. You look more closely at these more advanced creation options later in the chapter. Note SQLite provides a modest set of constraints that you can apply. Some commercial databases provide very rich and powerful constraint options, and it is tempting to use constraints to implement much of the business logic around the data. This is usually a mistake because it forces you to insert or modify your data in a particular order, which can become increasingly difficult to figure out. It is best to keep constraints for controlling data integrity and build the application logic into the program code. For now you leave the basic table definition as it is and move on to the more interesting topic of actually creating some data. Inserting data. The FIRST thing to do after creating the tables is to file them with data. You do this using the SQL. Insert statement. The structure is very simple. Insert into table name, column 1, column 2. Values, VALUE1, VALUE2. An alternate form of insert uses a query to select data from elsewhere in the database, but that's too advanced at this stage. You can read about it in the SQLite manual, which you can find at http slash slash lang html http slash 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 lang 130 chapter 3 managing data. To insert some rows into your employee table, do the following. Sklite insert into employee, EMP ID, name, hire date, grade, manager ID, Values, 1020304, John Brown, 2003-0623, Foreman, 1020311, Sklite insert into employee, EMP ID, name, hire date, grade, manager ID, values, 1020305, Fred Smith, 2004-0302, Laborer, 1020304, Sklite insert into employee, EMP ID, name, hire date, grade, manager ID, values, 1020307, Ann Jones, 1999-1125, Laborer, 1020304. And for the salary table. Sklite insert into salary, salary ID, grade amount, values, 000010, Foreman 60,000, Sklite insert into salary, salary ID, grade amount, values, 000011, Laborer 35,000. And that's it. You have created two tables and populated them with data corresponding to the values described in the introduction. Notice that you used actual numbers for the salary amount, not just string representations. SQLite tries to determine the correct data type based on the insert input values we provide. Because it makes the most sense to have SQLite maintain salary data as a numeric type, it behooves you to inform SQLite of that preference in your insert statements by specifying salary data in numeric not string format. Now you are ready to start experimenting with the data. This is where the fun starts. Reading data. You read data from a database using SQL's select command. Select is the very heart of SQL and has the most complex structure of all the SQL commands. You start with the most basic form and add additional features as you go. The most basic select statement looks like this. Select column 1, column 2. From table 1, table 2. 
Note you can use the special wildcard character, asterisk, instead of a list of filed names to return all of the files. You should only use this when working at the interactive prompt. If you were to use it in application code and someone later added an extra column to the database, your application would break. By specifying the exact files to be returned, your code becomes much more resilient to changes in the database. To select the names of all employees in your database, you use Sklite select name from employee, John Brown, Fred Smith and Jones. You are rewarded with a list of all of the names in the employee table. In this case that's only three, but if you have a big database that's probably going to be more information than you want. 2. Managing data using SQL 131. Restrict the output, you need to be able to limit your search somewhat. SQL enables you to do this by adding a WHERE clause to your SELECT statement, like this. SELECT COL1 COL2. From Table 1 Table 2. WHERE CONDITION. The condition is an arbitrarily complex Boolean expression that can even include nested SELECT statements within it. Now, add a WHERE clause to refee any your search of names. This time you only look for names of employees who are laborers. Sklite SELECT NAME, from employee, WHERE EMPLOYEE.GRADE equals LABORER, FRED SMITH AND JONES. You only get two names back, not three, because John Brown is not a laborer. You can extend the WHERE condition using Boolean operators such as AND, OR, NOT, and so on. Note that equals in a WHERE condition performs a case-sensitive test. When using the equals test, the case of the string is important. Testing for laborer would not have worked. SQLite has some functions that can be used to manipulate strings, but it also has a comparison operator called like that uses percent as a wildcard character for more flexible searching. The example just shown, written using like, looks like this. Sklite select name from employee, where lower, employee.grade, like lab percent, Fred Smith and Jones. After converting grade to lowercase, you then tested it for an initial substring of lab. When used in conjunction with lower, upper, and Sklite's other string manipulation functions, like can greatly increase the scope of your text-based searches. The SQLite documentation has a full list of the functions available. Note you can test out the SQLite functions in the interpreter using the following technique. In a select statement the return value can be any expression and the table clause can be empty. By combining these two features you can write code like select lower, Freddy, and SQLite returns the value Freddy. This is very useful when you want to quickly experiment with a function to see what it does. Notice too that in the where clause you used dot notation, employee.grade, to signify the grade filed. In this case it was not really needed because you were only working with a single table, employee, as specified in the from clause, but, where multiple tables are specified, you need to. 132 Chapter 3 Managing Data Make clear which table the file belongs to. As an example, change your query to phi and the names of all employees paid more than $50,000. To do that, you need to consider data in both tables. Sklite select name, amount, from salary, employee where employee.grade equals salary.grade, and salary.amount 50,000, John Brown 60,000. As expected, you only get one name back that of the foreman. But notice that you also got back the salary, because you added amount to the list of columns selected. Also note that you have two parts to your where clause, combined using an and boolean operator. The phi RST part links the two tables by ensuring that the common phi elds are equal, this is known as a join in SQL. A couple other features of this query are worth noting. Because the files that you are selecting exist in two separate tables, you have to specify both of the tables from which the result comes. The order of the filed names is the order in which you get the data back, but the order of the tables doesn't matter so long as the specified files appear in those tables. You specify add two unique filed names so SQLite can figure out which table to take them from. If you had also wanted to display the grade, which appears in both tables, you would have had to use dot notation to specify which table's grade you wanted, like this. Sklite select employee.grade, name, amount, from employee, salary etc. Slash. Note in particular that SQL would require such qualify cation even though the choice of table here for the grade filed really does not matter, because the where condition guarantees that for any result row displayed the grades of the two tables will have the identical value in any case. The phi NAL feature of select discussed here, although you can read about several more in the SQL documentation for select, is the capability to sort the output. Databases generally hold data either in the order that makes it easiest to phi and d things, or in the order in which they are inserted, in either case that's not usually the order you want things displayed. To deal with that you can use the order by clause of the select statement. It looks like this. Select columns from tables where expression order by columns. Notice that the phi and al order by clause can take multiple columns, 
This enables you to have primary, secondary, tertiary, and so on sort orders. You can use this to get a list of names of employees sorted by hire date. Sklite select name, from employee, order by hire date, and Jones John Brown Fred Smith. It is interesting to note that hire date was perfectly acceptable as an order by column, even though hire date is not a column selected for display. Managing data using SQL 133. And that's really all there is to it, you can't get much easier than that. The only thing worthy of mention is that you didn't use a where clause. If you had used one, it would have had to come before the order by clause. Thus, although SQL doesn't require that all components of a select statement be present, it does require that those elements that are present will appear in a prescribed order. That's enough about reading data, you now look at how to modify your data in place. Modifying data. You can change the data in your database in two ways. You can alter the contents of one or more records, or, more drastically, you can delete a record or even the contents of a whole table. Changing the content of an existing record is the more common case, and you do that using SQL's update command. The basic format is Update table set column equals value where condition. You can try it out on the employee database by changing the salary of a foreman to $70,000. Sklite update salary, set amount equals 70000 where grade equals foreman. Be careful to get the where clause right. If you don't specify one, every row in the table is modified, and that's not usually a good idea. Similarly, if the where clause is not specify C enough, you end up changing more rows than you want. One way to check you have it right is to do a select using the same where clause and check that only the rows you want to change are found. If all is well, you can repeat the where clause from the select in your update statement. A more drastic change you might need to make to your database table, rather than merely modifying certain files of a given row or rows, is to entirely delete one or more rows from the table. You would do this using SQL's delete from command, whose basic form looks like this. Delete from table where condition. So, if you want to delete Ann Jones from your employee table you can do it like this. Sklite delete from employee, where name equals Ann Jones. If more than one row matches your where condition, all of the matching rows are deleted. SQL always operates on all the rows that match the specified where condition. In this respect SQL is quite different from, say, using a regular expression in a Python program to perform substring substitution on a string, where the default behavior is to modify only the phi RST occurrence found, unless you specify Kali request otherwise. An even more drastic change you might want to make to your database is to delete not only all of a table's rows, but to delete the entire table itself. This is done using SQL's drop command. Obviously, destructive commands like delete and drop must be used with extreme caution. 134 Chapter 3 Managing Data Linking Data Across Tables The possibility of linking data between tables was mentioned earlier, in the section on select. However, this is such a fundamental part of relational database theory that you consider it in more depth here. The links between tables represent the relationships between data entities that give a relational database such as SQLite its name. The database maintains not only the raw data about the entities, but also information about the relationships. The information about the relationships is stored in the form of database constraints, applied when you define any the database structure using the create statement. Before you see how to use constraints to model relationships, you phi RST need to look deeper into the kinds of constraints available in SQLite. Digging deeper into data constraints. You normally express the constraints on a phi eld by phi eld basis within the create statement. This means you can expand the basic create definition from create table name.